Welcome, guys. Uh, my name's Luke Stuber, and myself and Jason Stoller will be doing this next session, and we're here to talk to you about sprayers. Really, what we've learned kind of this past year as we've continued to research and develop products, and uh, yeah, it's gonna be exciting. So to start with, I know I said we're gonna talk about sprayers, but let's just take a minute to compare planters and sprayers and what's happened over the last, call it 20 to 30 years. You know, I've got two planters up here behind me. We've got a 1990 John Deere 7200, and we've got a 2014 John Deere 1760. So they were manufactured 24 years apart. When you look at them from the distance, they look almost the same. You know, the chassis of the planter hasn't changed that much over the last 30 years. Sure, some of them have gotten wider, bigger. You could argue the row units have a little bit better materials. You would go from stamped steel to cast. But functionally, the chassis is relatively unchanged. But what has seen dramatic change is the components of the planter that actually plant the seed in the ground. You have to think about our metering technology. We've gone from finger meters to vac meters, ground drive to hydraulic drive to electric drive. The monitor, monitoring technology has drastically changed. I mean, blinky box monitors to monitors that tell you essentially what's happening with every seed. You know, fundamentally, every aspect of a planter that touches a seed and puts it in the ground has changed. Now think about sprayers. I've got two pictures up here. We've got an older spray coupe three-wheeler and a newer case Patriot. Both of these sprayers are sitting on my farm today. You know, when I look at the two sprayers, sure there's different manufacturers, but what's changed? And it's really the chassis that has changed. That Patriot has a much nicer cab, bigger tank, wider booms, just from an efficiency standpoint is a much more efficient sprayer. I can get a lot more done with it it's a lot more comfortable to drive as well. But what hasn't changed? You know, between those two sprayers, they both have a Raven rate controller in them. They both have a centrifugal pump. They both have a nozzle body and tips and section valves. You know, fundamentally, how they spray is unchanged. The components that take spray from the tank and to deliver it to the ground are identical between those two sprayers. The chassis is what has evolved. And I know there's some exceptions to this, but the vast majority of sprayers sitting on farms today are spraying with what I would call old technology, or technology that really hasn't evolved that much over the last 30 years. But the chassis, huge changes. And this, the, the fact that the components of the sprayer that spray that haven't changed, that, that's what's gotten us excited here at Precision Planning. And that's what we've started to look at over the last four to five years as we've entered the sprayer market, saying what, what can change? What could we do? And that's all the way from plumbing. You know, is there a way to upgrade the plumbing that's on the sprayer? Is there a way to change how rate is controlled? Can we control pressure? All the way into can we use vision systems to see weeds, identify weeds, and spray just those weeds? And that's what we want to talk to you today about. And so let's start with the basics. Let's start with the sprayer plumbing. If you think about your sprayer, when you go out to spray and you pull into the first field of the, of the morning, you know, what's the first thing that you have to do? If you did the, a good job the night before, you rinsed your sprayer out, and so you've got clean water in that boom, and you've got to get that water out. You kind of got two ways to do it. One, you back up to the edge of the ditch and dump it. You know, spray out 25, 30 gallon depending on the size of your sprayer, or you make that first pass along the edge, flip off your section control, come back and spray it again. You know, you've got to get that water out so that your chemical is ready to go so you don't leave a strip of weeds. You know, or you pull into that first field and you forgot to rinse it out the night before, and you burn your crop when you take off with that hot product that's in your boom. You know, I have saw two instances of this locally here in the last year driving around. So this isn't that uncommon. If you've sprayed much, you've probably done it. I thought another interesting thing is at times we think we've got the sprayer cleaned out from the night before and we don't. You know, the, the picture that we've got circled in blue up there, this was actually a sprayer that one of the guys from R&D was going to to do an install on. And the farmer called and said, hey, I've got my sprayer in the shop. 
I cleaned it out for you. It's ready to go. And he gets there, starts popping parts off. There is atrazine all over this thing. You know, that grower thought he had his sprayer cleaned out, and he didn't. And so as we've looked at this, it's like, how could we change the plumbing to eliminate these problems? And last year, we introduced Reclaim to you guys. And Reclaim is a retrofit boom recirculation system. So essentially, you add some additional plumbing to your boom, which gives you the ability to take spray from the tank to the boom and then flow it back to tank. And so you can prime your boom. So if you have water in your boom, you can prime it with that chemical. You can also recirculate. So if you're worried about something settling out, you can run the system to keep things agitated. And it also gives you the ability to purge. So if you want to, like at the end of the day, you could hook up a compressed airline and actually blow the chemical back into the tank. The other neat thing with the system is it will work with really any type of nozzles that are on the sprayer. So whether you have a PWM or electric nozzle shut off or just a traditional nozzle, you know, it'll work with either system because it's a low pressure recirc. So how does it work? So I'm gonna show you just a quick animation that, that shows how the system works. And what you're gonna see is the components in yellow are the additional reclaim components. So that's the components you would add to your existing sprayer. And so we'll, we'll start it up here. So you see those yellow components? So you've got some additional plumbing. There will also be a switch up in the cab that controls that, and there's what we call a recirculation valve. So when you're ready to recirculate, you kick your pump on, you turn on your recirculation valve, and now product flows from the tank to the boom back to tank. After you've gotten it recirculated or primed or whatever you're wanting to do, you simply turn off the switch, it closes that recirculation valve, and now you're ready to spray just like you were before. Your plumbing is back to how it was. And so last year we announced that it was a beta product. And so we ran, I think it was 30 systems in the field, and we learned quite a bit. So early on in the process, we got some calls out of a grower from, that was down in the south, I think he was in Texas actually, saying, hey, I am breaking fittings. And we said, well, that's, that's interesting. We've got a number of sprayers here, you know, in the Tremont, Illinois area running. We got a number of R&D sprayers running. We've done quite a bit of testing. We haven't seen this. And we said, hey, could you send us a video of what's happening? And this is what we got from him. So he's got a flat field, but he's got irrigation tracks. And what he told us is said, hey, I knew this was a beta product, so I wanted to stress the system for you. So I attempted to hit those irrigation tracks at 20 mile an hour. And when I broke the fittings, I actually got all four tires off the ground. And he was pretty excited about that. And we said, hey, thank you for helping us test. You know, we weren't quite expecting that level of, of dedication from him. And so we made a few changes, sent him some updated parts, and the feedback we got from him, hey, I couldn't break them this time. And he just said, thanks, you can slow down now so you don't break the rest of your sprayer. And so we learned from that, made a few changes, and we've now gone to commercial production with Reclaim. So if you'd be interested in a recirculation system, grab your dealer and have that discussion with them. So that's plumbing, but what about the components that actually spray? Right, you've got your rate controller. I think you could sit here today and say, hey, my rate controller does a great job controlling your rate, and I would agree with you. If you want 15 gallons per acre, guess what you get? You get 15 gallons per acre. The limitation with that, though, is the fact that you are not controlling your pressure. So when you just have rate control, as you change speed, your pressure has to change to compensate for that. So as you speed up, your rate stays the same, but your total gallons per acre will go up, which means your pressure goes up, which means your droplet size goes down. So it's actually droplet size that you're affecting. You know, if you slow down, the exact opposite happens. Your pressure drops your droplet size gets bigger. And so as we think about this, like how can we prevent this or how can we have a consistent droplet size when we spray? You know, if you have a traditional rate controller, the only way to do that is to drive one speed. Because in order to have a constant pressure, you have to have constant speed. That's not realistic. At least it's not when I'm spraying. And so how do we do this? And so last year we introduced our Symphony nozzle control system. And with Symphony, we are able to control the pressure and the rate independent of each other. So now on your 2020, you will set a target rate and a target pressure. And they're completely independent. 
And so one of the biggest questions we've got over the last year as we started to talk about this is how do you do this? You know, how does the system work? And pressure is pretty straightforward. Pressure is done with the pump. So you're controlling pressure with the pump. If I need more pressure, I simply spin the pump faster. If I need less pressure, I slow the pump down. The more difficult one is actually how do you control rate? And you're doing that by controlling the duty cycle at the nozzle. So there's a solenoid at every nozzle, and duty cycle is equal to the percent of on time of that nozzle. So in other words, if I'm at 25% duty cycle, it means that my nozzle is spraying 25% of the time, and 75% of the time it's actually off. But you're doing this at a very rapid rate, so you're, that gives it the pulsing action that you see with PWM systems. And so if I give you an example, if I pull into a field and I'm driving five miles per hour, and my duty cycle's at 25%, if I would speed up to 10 mile an hour, my total flow rate effectively doubles. And in order to maintain rate, that means my duty cycle would need to double as well. So my duty cycle would go from 25 to 50%. If I go from 10 to 20 mile an hour, once again, my rate doubles, which means my duty cycle would have to double. So as you speed up or slow down, your duty cycle will also increase or decrease in order to maintain your rate. And by doing that control at the nozzle, you can then continue to use the pump to control the pressure, and you can do that independent of each other. And so I know that, that can be a little bit complicated, so what we're gonna actually try to do here is we're actually just do it live for you. We're gonna try to do a live demo here. So I'm gonna have Dylan fire up the pump over here. So we're actually gonna spray with this R-series sprayer that we've got. I've got the pump plumbed to a hydraulic power unit outside, so we don't have to fire up the engine. And we are, from my computer, I'm gonna run in a fake GPS signal. So this sprayer will actually think it's driving through a field even though it's sitting here. I'm gonna have the guys over, cut over to the 2020 monitor. So I've got a cable run from the cab to my monitor here. And I'll show you what we're gonna see. So the map that you're gonna see, that's the duty cycle. So we're gonna actually map the duty cycle of the nozzle, and we'll talk about this as we go. And then over here on the right, we've got our rate and our pressure. So let me kick on the pump so we can see what those are set at. So I've got the rate set at 17 gallons per acre, and I've got my pressure set at 50. And then you're gonna see the metrics up at the top. That's our actual rate, and then our boom pressure, pump pressure. So our spray off pressure, or our hold pressure, I currently have it set at 60, so it's not equal to when we're actually spraying. So let me, let me start this up. So we're gonna get our sprayer moving here. And so I'm gonna, just to start with, I'm gonna set it at 10 mile an hour using my GPS program here. So I'm gonna kick the sprayer on. So what you see here is we're spraying at 10 mile an hour, 17 gallons per acre, and we're at, I'm targeting 50 PSI, I'm at 49 right now. What you see on the map is that our duty cycle is about 70%, so, or 60%, I mean, sorry about that. So it means 60% of the time we're actually spraying. So what happens when I speed up? So I'll speed up to 14 mile an hour. So you can hear the pump wind up to continue to make more spray, still maintaining our pressure, but look at our duty cycle as it goes up. Now our duty cycle is about, call it 80, 85%. So now 85% of the time those nozzles are actually spraying. So let me slow down now. So I'll slow down to seven mile an hour. Once again, we see our rate coming back to our 17. We're still got our boom pressure at 50 PSI. And now look at our duty cycle. You know, we're in that 40, call it 45% range. So now we've just varied our speed from seven to 14 mile an hour. We saw our duty cycle vary, but we maintained rate and pressure while we did that. The other thing to think about is because we have control over both rate and pressure, we can also then change those on the go. So think about it as you're spraying along the edge of the field, the neighbor's got a garden right there. Always makes you a little nervous. Maybe you throw a bigger droplet size, but you don't wanna worry about your speed. You know, you can lean over and simply lower your pressure and your rate stays the same. You actually could hear the pump slow down. I just dropped my spray pressure to 30 PSI but our rate's still good. So let me bump it back up to 50. Another thing to think about is because we have duty cycle across the boom, we can enable turn compensation. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna turn the sprayer, I'm gonna turn it to the right. And so which means that that far side will be the inside edge of the sprayer, this side will be the outside. 
So if you watch, you'll actually be able to see the difference visually in the spray. You'll, we'll also see it on the map. So I'm going to make my turn here. So we see the inside decreasing the flow, the outside in, increasing, and we come around. The other thing, too, is because we have control at the nozzle, you know, it gives us the ability to do high granularity swath. So as we come across there, you can see the swath come on and off. And you have control over that sprayer. Here, I'm going to turn again for you guys so we can see it. So once again, I'll turn. I'm going to turn the sprayer this way. So this is the inside. This is the outside. So keep your eye on it. So make the turn here. We're coming around. And you see the difference in that duty cycle. We're, we're varying the duty cycle from about 30% up to, call it 80. So we're seeing about a 2.5x change from the inside to the outside tip as we spray. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this now. Let me shut that down and cut back over. So, so guys, because we control that duty cycle at the nozzle, we can essentially control you know, almost every aspect of that sprayer on a nozzle level. You know, we have swath, turn compensation. We have that across the boom as well. And then really, the, it's pretty neat to be able to change your pressure and rate as you need it, and they are no longer dependent on each other. You know, another thing that we're kind of excited about the system is really how its architecture are laid out. It's, it's hard to see because all the wiring is behind the boom, so I've got a diagram up here for you guys to see. What we've done is, because this is a retrofit system, we know what's going on a lot of different sprayers, we've got a centralized module that we call a power distribution module. And that's kind of where all the wires from the cab go, your power ends up, the rate controller would be in there. But coming from that onto the boom, you basically take one wire and go to the left boom, one to the center, one to the right. And that wire is just a simple six pin to six pin extension. And it plugs into a module that we call a nozzle control module. And that nozzle control module will control four nozzles. So what you simply do then, once I control the first four, I simply take another extension to my next module and so forth down my boom. So it basically allows me, depending on my nozzle spacing, the width of my boom, total number of nozzles, I can pick out how many nozzle modules I need, what lengths of extensions I need, and then from each module, you would run four wires to those nozzles. The, the neat thing about it is, like if you do what I've done at times, where you back up to the edge of the field and you end up in a fence or a tree, rip a harness off, it's just a simple extension that you're ripping off. And so it's pretty easy to replace. There's no splices in any of the harnesses. Just a very, call it elegant solution from a retrofit standpoint. The other thing that we're excited about is this system is set up for the next round of technology. So we are building the Symphony nozzle control system to be ready for kind of the next wave. And Jason's actually going to be up now to, kind of, to talk through that. Thanks, Luke. Appreciate that. All right. So I need a little participation. So you guys are, should be well awake after a couple sessions. So raise your hand if you spray your own fields in terms of have your own sprayer. Okay. What about who? Have you, uh, raise your hand if you guys uh, uh, use a retailer or somebody else to spray your fields. Okay. So I'm guessing. And then and then uh, third question would be. Raise your hand if someone else is spraying your fields, but in the next couple of years, you intend to move towards spraying, uh, spraying your own acres. Any hands? Okay. All right. So it's probably about two thirds and a third for those of you that did that have your own, that uh, have your own sprayer um, versus have someone else do it. So, all right. For those of you that raise your hands and those of you that didn't, uh, I need your imagination. Okay. We're not. In the middle of January, it's not cold. This is early June. So this is your enlist soybean field. And whether you're scouting it for your own decision to spray or you're scouting this field for your, uh, for your retailer or someone else to spray for you, this is your field. You're enlist beans and you're trying to figure out, do I need to be spraying? And what rate do I need to be applying? So we stop in this spot in the field. What do we see? Anybody just shout it out. 
It's the morning glory. You guys see a little bit of morning glory there on the right? If you take a look at that. But the weed pressure isn't too high. The beans are pretty early stage. So we walk a little bit further and we stop in this spot. What do you see? I don't see anything, right? In fact, even if I look really close or I kneel down, I can't find a pinhead weed. So if the whole field looked like this, the right answer is to wait, right? It's zero rate today, right? I want to give, give the beans some time, maybe get another flush to come up before I hit it. But I just saw some morning glory, and so I'm trying to figure out what do I do? Do I need to be applying and... and, and uh, and what rate should I be going at? So we walk a little bit further. We stop in this spot in the field. So the answer is a little bit different, right? I see some giant rag. Also see some water hemp. So as we know, in central Illinois, water hemp's a lot tougher to control than most weeds. And so my decision now has changed. I've moved from I don't know if I should spray to maybe I shouldn't even be spraying at all to this spot in the field where, hey, I need to be in. That ragweed's probably 10, 12 inches tall and we've got water hemp coming on. Okay, we walk one more spot in the field and we stop in this spot. What do we see? See water hemp. Not only that, but you notice that some of those water hemp leaves are overlapping. So anytime we have overlapping leaves, our coverage is at, is at risk. So not only are we needing to spray, but we need to think about having enough active ingredient and water volume to do a good enough job to kill those weeds when we only have part of, the, part of those weeds that are actually, or leaves that are exposed. Okay, here's what the label says for Enlist. So what it says is it says we need to be applying a pint and a half of this product per acre when once the majority of the weeds in our field are at three to six inches in height. So right, that's a check mark, right, as we went to some of those spots in the field and we saw that. It also goes on to say, and it says apply two pints per acre if the weeds are larger than six inches tall. So even though only a fraction of the field falls into that category, guess what? That label is recommending for good control that I need to be at the max input spend to get the control that I want, okay? The label has a third recommendation and it says, we need to be at that maximum rate even if your weeds are small, but if we have heavy weed densities and it's to get that active ingredient on the partial coverage leaves that we do have. So as we think about it, actually I wanna come back to this in a minute, we've got a choice to make, okay? Option one, we follow what the label says. We're at max label, we're max input spend for the fraction of the weeds in our field. Option two is we roll the dice. We pick a rate somewhere in between that's gonna be more than sufficient for most of the field. But remember that as we step through and we scouted that field, we know there are some areas where we're gonna be actually crossing our fingers for that giant rag, maybe that was 10, 12 inches tall, or some of those areas in that water hemp. Or there's a third option, and this is probably more realistic. The amount of scouting that we just did right now in our imagination is probably more than we have time to do in a spring. And so in fact, most of us probably haven't had the time to do any scouting in our fields. And so we're making a decision for a pint and a half because that's what we bought last fall, and that's what's going on. What we just experienced is compromise. It's the acceptance of standards that are lower than desirable, and it's for really good reasons, right? For absolutely very valid reasons, we have to compromise. We have to make that decision. It's not our goal, though. Our goal is to optimize. The definition of optimize, it's to make as perfect, effective, or functional as possible. When we compromise, we do that for really good reasons. It's we, we're forced into that trade-off when we blanket apply, right? We're ultimately deciding chemistries, rates, and making that trade-off in terms of an ROI that we're gonna spend. And we're deciding that usually four months before we even, even have the chance to know what, what's in the field, right? We're pre-selecting the herbicide and the rate to fit a budget and do what we hope will be a good enough job, maybe three or four months ahead of that. Our goal is the opposite, and we all want this, right? We wanna nail weed control. We wanna be able to pick the chemistries that give us the best chance at doing that, and the rates that do that, but we wanna do that in a way where we actually minimize our input costs. And so, as we've taken a look at the sprayer, and Luke talked about that, four or five years ago, we took a step back and said, what does it look like to do that, to truly optimize sprayers? 
we're convinced that it's going to take tech to do that. It's going to take the ability to intelligently apply the right rate and only where it's needed. And so as we think about that, the game totally changes when we actually have the ability, when the sprayer has the ability to detect weeds and then to make a decision on what it actually detects. That's where we're headed with what we call symphony targeted spraying. So it's a vision system upgrade to the base system that, Lu that Luke spent the last 20 minutes uh, showing you and demonstrating to you. So that vision system is what you see behind me. So you see a set of vision modules that go across the entire sprayer. Those vision modules are running our software, our uh, neural network software that's actually been trained based on being able to identify the difference between weeds, categories of weeds, crop, and residue. Okay, so we're separating out those aspects that are weeds. That vision module is on the fly, deciding what is a weed and what's not, and then it's actively controlling the symphony nozzles based on that. And it's doing that at 15 mile an hour. So 15 mile an hour, that's 22 feet per second. So you think about it, every second, 22 feet are going by, and we're making a decision on an inch by inch basis, should we spray and should we not? So in the most basic mode, Symphony targeted spray does what we call spot spray. So that means if weeds are detected, the nozzles are on. If we don't detect any weeds, they're off. It also has another mode that we call auto rate. So what that is, is that's where in, in my 2020, what I do is I set my minimum rate that I want and I set my maximum, and then the system is automatically varying the rate based on weed density and based on weed size both together. And so the system's automatically doing that. It gives me the ability to do what the label describes to truly optimize um, if I want that. But then I also can go all the way to the point where we're doing the true spot spray from that perspective. We also are building in the capability to do what we call dual product independent control. So that's where the vision modules are taking care of that, that ability to turn on and off based on what they see, but also we're able to, in the same pass at the same time, apply a blanket residual program. So that's a part of our engineering efforts and that'll be an option to be able to do that, uh, which obviously makes a ton of uh, sense on our, on our pre-plan application. So. All right, this is a project that I think it's probably been, uh, this shows 2019, but I think it was probably about 2017 that we really took a hard look at saying uh, and committing to ultimately get to the point of intelligently spraying based on what we're detecting. So it started with early research and image sensor development to the point of being able to category, categorize and train models with our data sciences and our computer vision teams. Uh, ultimately to this past year. So 2022 was a really big milestone. It's what we call an alpha. So an alpha is the earliest stage where, where we get out with, uh, with our prototype hardware, prototype software, whatever we're testing, and we do that on real production acres. And so I'm gonna step through a few field examples, give you a feel for what it looked like this past spring. So this is the first one. This is called Route 9 West. So this is the drone's view. We actually sprayed this field um, May 10th. Uh, this was, we sprayed it about a, a few days or a week after it was planted, so you can kind of see the planting lines. And, and as you can tell, uh, in this field there was obvious grass pressure. And not only that, there was broad leaves. You can't see it from the drone view, but we were dealing with both of those. The, the, uh, the grower's program was 32 ounces of Roundup is what we were, we were putting down in that case. So, you know, one of the aspects of our culture at R&D, our engineering culture, um, is at a very early stage uh, taking the risk to take prototype software, prototype hardware, and drive that forward onto production acres. Um, it drives a lot of challenge, a lot of pain for us, but ultimately it accelerates our learning and accelerates what we would not have discovered have we, had we just stayed in an early test phase um, a lot longer. And so this field was an example of that. This was really early into our development where we were bringing together prototype vision modules, our artificial intelligence software, 2020 software, and, and putting it together to work. There's also opportunities though when you do that that you get a real potential into the opportunity or the value of a product. And you don't realize that until you get on production acres and you experience that 
um, in that way. And so I can tell you this spring, on May 10th, on Route 9 West was that example. This is a photo that I actually took myself with my iPhone sitting in the cab. To be able to see for, from ourselves, and I want you guys to experience that really soon, what it looks like when I'm actually spraying at a speed fast enough that those models are detecting and we're hitting, hitting what we're seeing. And so what you see here is exactly that. Um, the accuracy was phenomenal, especially at this early stage in the development. We were detecting weeds, we were automatically spraying, and then we were able to provide maps um, in the cab as well of our as applied. So there was also opportunity, actually I wanna pause a minute here, there's also opportunity um, in the early stages to look what else could we do with this technology. And this field gave us an opportunity. So I'm gonna share for you guys the first time, this is the first session we're talking about this, something that we're considering in the future. So we've talked about, and actually we've got some of our data scientists and computer vision software guys back there. So one of the things we're talking about, what else could we add to, the, to, this, uh, to this system? You know, targeting weeds makes a lot of sense. As we think through that, but what about wildlife? What if we actually could detect coyotes? Or, I don't know, I was talking to Luke as an avid hunter, so maybe, uh, maybe we can figure out uh, the size of the bucks in the future with our data science team. So anyway, we'll see where we go with that. Somebody mentioned a shotgun attachment. I don't know if that'll be on the table, but, uh, but we'll see. Um, all right, so Route 9 West, this is the panorama as applied map after we sprayed. So anytime you see red, that's where the nozzles were off. Anytime you see green is where we were spraying. We used 970 gallons across 258, 215 acres for this field. What we would have used had we blanket applied would have been 4,300 gallons. That is a 77% reduction in herbicide. Not only that, we refilled one time and so that would have been six. And I can tell you, Luke was with me that day, along with Andrew Bear. Andrew was spraying, and we were, we were in the cab at the time. It is an incredible feeling to be racking through fields and not stop. And the efficiency gain uh, that we saw and experienced that day uh, was phenomenal. There's also, oops, got to jump back a little bit. Two weeks later, this is what it looked like. So this is actually a photo that Corey Mulbauer and I shot and took when we were in the field. And to be able to walk into my field and I can take my as-applied map and be able to see the, the performance and know that we only put on a quarter of the product that we would have if we had blanket applied. Um, gave us, again, like I mentioned, it gives you that early opportunity, that glimpse in development to say, what, what is the real potential of this technology? And uh, day one of this past spring, uh, that was really real. That was really real. Okay. Another field I'm going to step through. This is called Irish. It's a 70-acre field. This is... Uh, uh, this, this is actually video footage that we took when we were spraying. So again, this was in spot spray mode. So we were running, it was a pre-plant application. We had 32 ounces of Roundup and, and uh, 16 of 2,4-D. So it was uh, fall minimum till and we were going into soybeans this last year. This is the as applied map and panorama. So again, anytime you see red, that's where those nozzles are off. In this case, we use, ended up using 225 gallons in what would have been if we had applied across those 70 acres of flat rate, that would have been actually around 1,400. So that was an 84% reduction in herbicide. We used 16% of the Roundup and glyphosate for this field. This is actually a field from my farm, so I can tell you when it's your own farm and you experience that, that makes it a lot more real too uh, in terms of the opportunity um, and that becomes really obvious. So there's an additional opportunity and, uh, or product or feature that we're building into Symphony Targeted Spray, and that's what we call vision scouting. Okay, so what vision scouting is, is it's maps and reports of what the vision system is seeing while we're spraying. So one example of that that we're going to talk about here is a weed density map. So in panorama, you're seeing exactly that, though, our weed density map from the iris field. So anytime I see green on that map, that means it's very low weed pressure. Anytime I see yellow or red, that's going to be higher. So that's my waterway, and, and as you expect, really close to the waterway, that's where I'm seeing the higher, my higher weed pressure. 
There's an additional feature included in, in uh, vision scouting also, in addition to a map like weed density, um, and that's the fact that with our vision modules, we're automatically collecting images while we're spraying, okay? So we're, we're collecting those images and we're making decisions to spray, but we're also intelligently collecting images to make those available to you on your phone alongside of your weed map. And so I'm gonna show you an example of that for weed density. So in Panorama, we have the ability for the system that's automatically collecting those images to make those available and overlaid. So not only do I know what my weed density is in terms of pressure, but I also have the ability to know exactly what it looks like the day we sprayed. I know my weed size, I can, know, I can understand the type of weed. As we think about our post applications, right, our intention with vision scouting is to have crop emergence uniformity maps and to be able to have images that are overlaid in panorama. And so I'll have the ability to look at my crop stand um, and to be able to do that uh, without ever having to ha take in a step in the field. So that's where we're headed with vision scouting and that's integrated into the Symphony targeted spraying product. So that's how we're, how we're looking at vision scouting um, as an integration of the product itself. Okay. So the example that I just gave you for Irish, this is the weed density map or the vision scouting map for that. There's another application for maps like these. So this is a digital record of where, where our weeds are at and what our pressure is. We can take that and we can use that to get better with our herbicide programs. Okay, so this is my soybeans. This was my pre-plant application ahead of soybeans this last year in 2022. I'm going into corn this coming year. My plans are for pre-plant that I'm gonna be unit using a soil residual along with contact herbicide. So Harness Extra is an example. I'm planning to put down the label says 2.3 to 3 quarts an acre for these soil textures, Sable and Ipeva soil textures. But it specifies, it says, to be using the higher rate where we have heavier weed pressures. So now that I have a digital map or I have a map or a record of where my weed pressure is, we can cr take that and we can create a prescription to do exactly what our residual herbicides give us the ability to do or they suggest that we do. So as we take a look at that, this is exactly what we did. So I worked with Corey. We created a prescription uh, that we intend to execute on Irish this coming spring. So for our soil residual herbicide, we kept it really simple, 2.3 quarts anywhere where our weed pressure was low. Anytime where it was medium or high, we're running at that maximum three quarts an acre. And then our intention is to run dual product independent control for this spring. So we'll be running on this field with our residual herbicide in a 2020 with prescription, and our vision modules will still be doing auto raider or spot spray for our contact herbicide. And the goal is ultimately input savings right on the contacts and to be able to do a better job for the same cost of our, with our soil residuals in that way. Okay, I've got one more field example from this past spring. Field name is West of House. Uh, this is a post application, as you can tell. And in fact, these were enlist soybeans um, that, that we sprayed. So this is some video footage from this field. This is uh, us running across those acres in spot spray mode. The uh, we were actually had ragweed and we had water hemp. Uh, both were present. We were spraying a little bit early and we wanted to, but, but needed to be in uh, because of the size of the weeds. So. Anyway, the program was Enlist and Liberty together. So this was a tank mix, 32 ounces of, of Enlist and 40 of, uh, of Liberty. Here's the as-applied map for the field. Actually, what you're seeing on the top in panorama is the as-applied map. So you can see red is where, where it's off, and green is where it's on, and then it's split view. And so you can get a glimpse into the weed density or the weed pressure in that field. So for this post application, when we actually measured our tank usage, we were at 81% reduction in herbicide. So those of you that spray your own fields, or, or those of you that have somebody else, another rate show of hands. Um, who uses an Enlist and Liberty combo today? Yep, so yeah, a good chunk of you guys. You guys know what a big deal this is, 81% reduction in herbicide. I ran the numbers, this, for me, this is what it would have cost me. To spray this field, it would have been 36 bucks an acre. 
because of running Symphony targeted spray, it ended up being $7. If this was 2,000 acres instead of one field, on one pass in one year, that would have been $58,000 savings. So if you take a look at the potential from an input savings perspective, it's phenomenal. I probably walked into this spring realizing there was potential, but I, I did not appreciate it until we actually used it and saw the, saw the opportunity. Phenomenal input savings. But I think there's a bigger opportunity than just the savings, okay? Think about it this way. You know, in the past, if I think about Enlist and Liberty, maybe I didn't, uh, or maybe today, I've yet to move to a program like that because of cost. Or maybe I'm dealing with resistance and I've got, and I'm running only one mode of action and I need to be looking at two or maybe three. Or maybe I'm running in Liberty. Those of you that are running a Liberty program, you know that coverage really matters for Liberty. And so the right answer for heavy weed pressure might be 25 gallons an acre, but I'd be refilling all the time. With technology like this, with Symphony Target Spray, we now have the flexibility to make a different decision than maybe what we could have or would have in the past. So here's my challenge to you guys. Don't look at the technology and say, I'm gonna try to figure out if this fits into my herbicide program. Don't look at it that way. The potential is too great to try to cram it into what you're doing today and say it only, that's the only way we can do it, right? Think about this technology and say, there is real opportunity in input savings. There's real opportunity in doing a better job of weed control. I'm gonna figure out how do I actually change my program to accommodate the value of this technology. So Luke's gonna come up, he's gonna finish up, and he's gonna do exactly that on their farm. He's gonna step through how they're rethinking their applications based on the technology and what they wanna do with it. Yeah, so guys, as Jason and I were talking through this, it was like, how do we leave you with something kind of practical here at the end? <clears throat> and I feel like I kind of have a unique place at the table. So I farm here in the Tremont area, we do all our own spraying, and then we also working here, I have seen this technology over the last five years as we've worked on it and developed it. We've had the opportunity to do some of the beta testing and, and run it myself. You know, I've, I've actually covered a fair number of acres with both Symphony nozzle system and the targeted spray system. And so it's kind of like how, how are, or how are, what are we thinking about on our own farm? So my dad is the one that typically lays out our programs and we've talked about it fairly extensively. So what I wanna do is go through one of our programs. So we've got a number of different ones. We raise commercial corn, seed corn, GMO soybeans, and non-GMOs. And so they're all different, and I think how they would all have to change is different to optimize the technology. And so I'm gonna to touch on our, our current Enlist Liberty program. So where we're raising Enlist soybeans is typically our higher weed pressure farms. And so we have a lot of water hemp pressure and a lot of giant ragweed. And so our pre-pass typically consists of a contact killer plus residual. The contact killer is dependent on our tillage situation. So if we're running a field cultivator right ahead of the planter, that may not be in there. If it's a minimal till situation, we're definitely putting it in. Then we are currently budgeting for two post passes. I mean, it's a very expensive program. We're looking at 92 bucks an acre. But if we want what I'm gonna call clean fields, we've gotta have those two posts. We're not getting it with one, at least where we're farming. And so we start looking at this like, where is the opportunity? You know, the immediate opportunity is in those contact killers. You know, like what Jason was talking about, what everything that we're seeing here is probably 75 to 80% of that contact killer that you're putting down is wasted. There's not actually weeds in that area of the field. And so our total contacts are about $70. You know, our residuals aren't going away. I do think there is opportunity there to variable rate them and get them in the right place but that's probably a sunk cost for us. But like, where is this 70 bucks? You know, what can we do with it? I think too, for us, the first place we're gonna look is in our post passes. I mean, dual product technology is being developed and is coming, but it's not, I mean, it's not available yet. And, but we start thinking about the posts, like what Jason just talked about, like this technology is gonna be there pretty quick. You know, this is the first place I think we can, we can see opportunity, and it's actually for us the majority of our cost, you know, about 53 bucks. And so what could our new program look like moving forward? And right now what we are currently thinking is we actually go from two posts to three posts. 
But think about the efficiency of those passes. You know, I'm going to currently budget 25% for my first post, 15% for my second post, and my third post, I could even call this a cleanup pass. I think it's probably 5% or less. And I think these are conservative numbers based on everything we're seeing. If we can achieve this, we go down to 12 bucks an acre. It's a $41 an acre cost savings of direct input costs. Now, I can see a few guys out there thinking, man, three post passes. You know, a lot of people don't even want to do two. And I understand that. I mean, it's a lot of time spent in the sprayer. But think about how efficient these passes are. You know, in my traditional program, my Enlist Liberty program today, I'm spraying 20 gallons per acre. I got a 1,000 gallon tank. I'm filling every 50 acres. With my targeted spray program, now my first post, I'm hoping to fill roughly every 200. My second post, every 330. And my third post, you know, I fill once a day, call it 1,000 acres. I don't even know if I can cover 1,000 acres in a day. I've never done it before, but I'd like to find out. But I mean, think about how efficient this is. I mean, my tender driver no longer is a full-time job. You know, today, our tender guy, and we need two guys to spray. One guy tendering, one guy spraying, and both of them are running hard all day long. You know, once I get into especially my second and third post, my tender guy shows up once, twice a day to fill me up, and he can go do something else. I mean, I believe that we will actually have fewer man hours in three posts than we did in our two. And when I think about this, if I just projected over 1,000 acres, my traditional program, I was at 40 fills, 53 grand, I think I go to about nine fills and 12 grand. And so yes, I put a little bit more machine hours on actually running through the field, but by eliminating all that fill time, eliminating my tender driver, I think my total man hours and I think my total time spent spraying is actually the same. You know, everybody's different, but when we are spraying, we're filling about 30% of the time. So our sprayer is sitting at the edge of the field and we're effectively eliminating 75 to 80% of that time, and instead we're putting it into that third pass to clean things up. So I think I can have less time, less man hours, fewer dollars, and better weed control with this technology. So what I would challenge you guys is to think about your programs, whether that's corn, soybeans, cotton, sugar beet, you name it, and look at it and say, okay, where's the opportunity? And also, what would I need to change? There's very few programs, how they're being executed today, that are optimized for this technology. And I think to really get the real bang for your buck out of it, or the real value, you're gonna have to change something. I don't think the status quo is really gonna be optimized. So no, I know we've thrown a lot at you guys today. All the way from plumbing, with our reclaim system, you know, the retrofit boom recirculation, to the symphony nozzle control system, to the targeted spray. Both the symphony nozzle control and the targeted spray, we are what we're calling a beta stage. So we will be running sprayers kind of across America um, this past, this next year, spring and summer, fall. And depending on how that goes, will be our next steps. And then Jason did touch on the vision scouting, some of the potential benefits there. One we didn't talk about today is vision row guidance. I mean, this same vision technology that can see weeds can also identify rows and use that identification of your rows to effectively steer your sprayer you know, or your tractor. And so that's all we're gonna talk about that one today, but thanks guys for coming. So you're gonna be going to your next session. We're gonna exit out this door over here. We've got just a couple of minutes. Jason and I will be down up front and the guys with the signs will be over here. So thanks for coming. <laughs>